Okay, let's rewind back uh, two years ago in the fall of, 2017, fall of 2015. At that time, Shopify Plus was just starting to transition from primarily a sales office in Waterloo to a product organization. At the time, there were a handful of engineers within the team. Um, some of them were supporting internal, internal teams, and a couple of them were appointed to get started on what product might look like for Shopify Plus. And specifically, they had been given the area of B2B. It's a large market, and perhaps there was something there that we could start to offer our Shopify Plus merchants. And they did what any passionate, dedicated, talented tech team would do. They dove headfirst into really understanding the problem space, explored technical solutions, worked meticulously week over week to understand how they were improving and tracking their goals against um, their agile sprint methodologies. So that team worked meticulously week over week tracking their, tracking their goals and improvement using demos, sprint planning, retros. And you can imagine how that team felt when they demoed their first release to stakeholders and it fell totally flat. So fast forward a couple more months when UX was brought into the organization. And now that product team of engineers and user experience designers did what any passionate, dedicated, and talented team would do. They dove headfirst into understanding that problem space. They mapped out user journeys. They talked to users. They explored technical solutions. They meticulously tracked their progress week over week using agile sprint methodologies. And you can imagine how they felt when they released their alpha in the spring of that year to absolutely no fanfare. Okay, so let's fast forward a couple more months when Shopify Plus made its next strategic hire, which was the director of product. So now we had a product organization with product management, engineering, and user experience working together. And that team did what any passionate, dedicated, and talented team would do. They dove headfirst into understanding the market, understanding the needs of their users, mapping out the journey, exploring technical solutions, interviewing internal stakeholders. And you can imagine how that team felt when they released their beta in the fall of 2016 with great success. They had large adoption from their merchant base and that continues to be a very successful offering of the Shopify Plus line. Okay, so what's new here? I mean, trifecta is in this balance, this notion of having product engineering and user experience working together in, on product development is not anything new. Don Norman uh, released a uh, notion of the um, a balanced stool approach, the three-legged stool approach to product design, which was having each of these perspectives uh, a part of that process. So this is nothing new. We've heard about this before. But spoiler alert, everything else is new. Everything else has changed around us. Top tech talent is in very high demand. If you have a product organization that's not functioning on all cylinders, that's not a high achieving organization, you run the risk of losing that top talent. Product release cycles have greatly decreased in time. You can go to market a lot quicker. And so you can bet dollars to donuts if your team misses out on an opportunity to release, that a competitor is going to swoop in there and find that opportunity instead. We as leaders within the tech space and as members of the tech community have a responsibility to challenge our status challenge the status quo, challenge the methods that we have used in the past, past because they may not be the things that lead us to success in the future. The way in which product design and engineering worked before is not necessarily going to work moving forward. And that's really what I want to spend our time on today, is how do we look at trifectas? How do we look at these three roles working together moving forward? 
Okay, so first, let's go back to basics. What do I mean when, when I say a trifecta? In nature, there is, a very, there is a very lovely balance that's achieved in the power of three. You often hear a lot of sayings, anecdotes, uh, you know, doesn't happen twice, when it happens three times, three times a charm, three musketeers. There are endless, there are endless examples of the number three and how the, when working together, there is a nice balance there. So that concept isn't, um, isn't new, but um, we're talking about the relationship between three things. When we start talking about product development, we're talking about the viability of that product, how, um, how possible, how much of a need is there for this, this product offering. We're talking about feasibility. Are we able to offer a solution that is going to satisfy the needs of our users? And we're talking about desirability. Is this going to be a compelling enough uh, problem solver to enable or to motivate your users to drop your competitor's product or the competing offering and pick up yours instead. And really at the end of the day what we're talking about is product engineering and user experience. So what is it about these perspectives that make them an incredibly strong triad? Right? How do these three roles come together and give us a slightly different perspective? Well, if I go back to my original, the original uh, story that I told you in the be beginning, it's not for a lack of passion, it's not a lack of talent, and it's not a lack of interest that, that either creates success or not. It's this notion that each of those uh, domains brings a slightly different skill set and a slightly different perspective. And in working together, there is a very healthy tension there to make sure that each of those are pulling in, in a well-balanced and orchestrated way to make sure that you come up with the best solution, that you have um, considered all the different perspectives involved Okay, so if we talk about trifectas at scale, um, what does that actually look like? Okay, so I'm gonna take you through a little bit about working in smaller organizations and, work, and then working up. So in small organizations, you tend to have all three of these roles operating within a single team. All three of the perspectives may be carried by individuals or may be shared across a couple of individuals. They're, they, um, they are solely responsible for their own destiny. They are the ones who are setting the vision, tracking their progress week over week, setting their milestones. They are working in very close proximity, so they're probably either co-located within the same office or at least on the same floor. So, so communication and making sure that, that context is shared across the entire team is relatively easy for project teams of this, of this size. It's easier to keep aligned when you're working right next to the person um, day in and day out. Okay, so woohoo, the demand for your product increases, you go on a little bit of a hiring spree, and now you've got multiple individuals in your organization. It looks a little bit different from what it did before. Now, instead of just having one project team, you have multiple project teams. Not everyone is working on the same problem anymore. Now individuals become separated and start working around different clusters of problems. There may not even be commonalities across these problem sets anymore. Um, and so there isn't that shared context that's even necessary across projects. Um, because folks may not necessarily be co-located anymore, now even perhaps they're on a different floor, maybe they're in a different building, depending on how much space you have. Um, the efficiency and the effectiveness of collaborating across these projects becomes a lot more difficult. Communication starts to break down, and people just don't even have the time to be able to wear both the hat of context sharer as well as designer or PM and so on. And so now in this kind of scenario, the organization is really gonna benefit 
from an overarching triad or an overarching trifecta of those three pers perspectives to help steer the individual teams in the right direction. So I just want to touch on when uh, an organization might be ready to make a shift from being a single project team to now doing, to looking a little bit like this in case any of those things start to resonate with you. So the first one is around efficiency of communication, right? So is everybody able to gain the same message within a, within a uh, reasonable period of time? And moreover, does it even make sense for everyone to get the same piece of information? Is that piece of context that's being shared going to help an individual who is working on problem set A, or um, is that appropriate for everyone? The next thing is, is there some stability in the kinds of problems that are being solved um, by a particular group, or is there, are there new ones being added? And to be honest, the other might be true too. Are you deinvesting in things? As soon as you start to get stability in a certain problem space and then start branching out to new areas, you're going to start to see that this kind of um, organization starts to shape out. Because, because the one team is not kind of churning on a whole bunch of ideas, you start to have, okay, folks, you go off in this direction, and we'll have another group who will start thinking about maybe either another feature set or another product or another release and so on. And then the last thing is, is there enough project work, you know, is there enough um, uh, stuff to do, designs to create, code to write, that prevent folks from being able to do both that as well as the management as well as being able to set the overall vision for each of these teams, for example, as well as deciding on whether or not we need to hire, as well as deciding uh, who's going to be in the interview process and investing the time in those things, for example. So if you start to find that you have already enough execution work and there are still a number of other management or leadership things to uh, achieve, you might find that your organization is ready for an overarching body of these roles. Okay, so you continue to be successful in the marketplace. You continue to hire. You continue to expand the product, which is awesome. And now the need to grow to support these investment areas continues. So here, we find that projects start to cluster around given themes. Now these problems that are being solved are not totally siloed, but you have a couple of projects, for example, that revolve around the buyer experience. Maybe you have a couple of projects that revolve around a seller experience if you're looking at a marketplace scenario, for example. And so within that, there is a lot of necessary and relevant context sharing that can happen within that group, within that project area, that doesn't necessarily translate over to the other product area. And so the efficiency of communication is really vertically and not horizontally, and you end up with multiples of these pillars across the organization. So oversight in the organization at this level then comes from a product level trifecta where now you have the senior leadership team of PM, of UX, and of engineering sitting at the topmost level with an additional trifecta layer in the middle as well. So just to give you a little, uh, little insight and peek behind the covers at Shopify Plus, over the last two years, our organization, from the time that um, I told you we started with just a handful of engineers, the team has grown uh, both organically as well as through acquisitions and natural hiring as well. And so now here's where roughly where the R&D organization uh, sits, with these ratios actually holding pretty steady across each of the offices that we have, each of the R&D organizations across Shopify. Um, so as, you, as the number of people grows, the shape and the size of the organization will also start to flush out. So the trifecta model for an organization, what are some of the benefits that that is going to offer? 
Well, the first one is that it provides the freedom and an autonomy for project teams to move really quickly. Project team A does not have to worry about the dysfunction, for example, of project team C to be able to move forward. They can work at their own pace using their own tools and techniques and not having to subscribe to what everybody else is, is doing. You can move a lot quicker and a lot faster when you have dedicated resources and a set of uh, domain expertise within your own project team. Uh, along the same lines, you end up with a defined pool of, of resources where within, if I go back here to our, a couple slides ago, if I go back to this model here, uh, this, the domain trifecta, for example, on the left-hand side of this slide, if one of these projects kind of goes sideways, they are able to reassign these resources to either spin up a new project that takes advantage of all their domain knowledge, or they can group these two projects into one. But we don't have to worry about horse trading folks way across the organization, across domain expertise at all. You end up with a great group uh, or a great team of individuals that you can assign as needed for your individual product area. And really the trifecta model provides a really stable foundation for your organization. So when you are ready to spin up a new project, when you find that you have some stability with the kinds of new problems that you're solving and want to even spin up a new trifecta, you've already got that model in place and the shift within the organization is not nearly as jarring to your employees. They already understand what the structure is and spinning up a new team becomes natural and easy and a smooth process. So at the end of the day, the trifecta, whether it be at the domain or the product level, really provides structure and vision and flexibility so that those project teams can move efficiently and effectively. A lot of the um, uh, overhead of context sharing, communicating up and down and across with different stakeholders, a lot of that work is offloaded from the individual project teams and those project teams can do what they do best which is executing against a defined vision and tracking their progress week over week or whatever the cadence of those sprint plans might be. So we've talked a lot about what trifectas are and I should take a minute to just mention what trifectas are not. So firstly, they're not just for product organizations. So at Shopify, for example, we extend this model into any of our service offerings. So even, for example, on the growth side, on our marketing side, we just have different roles holding those perspectives. So where you might have a product manager holding that role of what's the viability of our offering within the market uh, for a product, on the marketing side, you might have your CMO or your marketing manager holding that set, those set of requirements or setting that product direction for that campaign or that event that you're running. It's not just about a balanced skill representation. It's not just about having those individuals on the team, but really le leveraging those skills and using them at, in the leadership levels as well to make sure that those perspectives are well balanced and being heard. Sometimes having those different levels can feel like they're a gatekeeper, like they're the ones making the decisions saying yes or no. Um, and sometimes, you know, in the off case, that's going, to be, that's going to be how it is. But more often than not, the trifecta groups are really steering teams. It's a, it's, a, it's a second level of check, of gut check for those project teams to be able to execute. Ultimately, at the end of the day, those project teams are the ones closest to the users, closest to the code, closest to the designs, and should be in the best place to be making decisions about whether or not we should move forward. Are we ready to move to our next milestone? Do we need to change direction? Are we missing resources? And really the trifecta is the one that enables those teams to move faster based on those decisions, or are the ones to be poking that team to be asking themselves those questions if they're not already. And finally, trifectas most definitely are not easy. 
getting into an established rhythm where those three parties are playing together as a team constructively takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to build that trust and for those folks to understand how to communicate in an aligned way um, so that all parts of the business get the message at the same time um, and to oper in, in concert, operate in concert. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through a couple of the heuristics or the principles around trifectas. The first being that they have clear responsibilities and should be held accountable for certain decisions. Okay, so the product trifecta. So this is at the highest level of the organization. So these are the folks who are dreaming in years and really operating in quarters, right? So they're the ones with the high level vision thinking really strategically and far out and thinking about what do we need to offer the marketplace in this quarter. They're gonna be reprioritizing that roadmap on an ongoing basis, on a quarterly basis, based on changes that come in and out of the organization and things that are happening externally in the marketplace. Uh, so some of their responsibilities are resource, uh, resourcing, finding new talent for the area, helping uh, with Hiring funding, for example, uh, identifying new leaders and leadership within the organization. They're also responsible for defining that organization model, uh, making sure that people are in the right place to, uh, to create a healthy organizational structure. Um, they're also going to be spinning up new project areas, identifying new areas of growth, and really the opposite of this as well is deciding when it's time to shut down either a, a domain, when we no longer need to invest in this area because we've actually pivoted and gone in a different direction. Um, and so some of the uh, activities that they will be doing, as I mentioned before, is org design, um, setting strategic priorities annually for a given, uh, for the team, uh, very high level uh, strategic visionary work. Then we move on to our domain trifectas. So the domain trifectas here at that middle level, now these are the ones who are dreaming in quarters and really operating at a more milestone level, which may be a month or six weeks, depending on your particular cadence. So they're taking the inputs from that product group and really understanding now how do we operationalize that quarter? What do we need to, uh, what vision and direction do we need to give each of our project, project teams and targets for them to hit over these over the uh, upcoming months. These folks really are leading teams of teams. They're responsible for communicating to an individual project team what their vision is, making sure that they are all aligned and heading in the same direction. Some of you earlier today attended uh, a story mapping workshop that we ran over at uh, Time Hero. And that was an example of a, an alignment tool that gets, gets everybody on the same page. It's a way to visualize um, what's in everybody's head and the direction that you're heading for a given milestone. The trifecta here may not um, run that activity, but they may very well participate it, and they are responsible for making sure it or something like it is happening. They might not be the doers, but they're the ones to kind of put in check uh, uh, the people uh, to make sure that those kinds of activities and those alignment activities are happening. And then finally, the project teams. So now these are the ones who are dreaming in months looking at those milestones, but really executing on a week by week or bi-weekly cadence, depending on what your sprint, uh, how you do sprint planning. So these are the ones, the project team is really the one exec executing against that project brief, executing against that problem statement, and really bringing it to life. Uh, you'll see a number of sprint rituals, retros planning, uh, retros planning demo, um, communicating with stakeholders, mostly the domain level trifectas, letting them know when they're ready to move to the next milestone, when they're ready to sign off, or when they need to go back to the drawing board because they haven't quite hit the mark for one reason or another. Um, everyone is going to have some level of involvement 
at each of the different levels, uh, each of the different trifecta levels, so either at the product, the domain, or the project teams, it will just be in varying degrees across that product release cycle. So your product trifecta is going to kick off the roadmap for the year or for that quarter. That trifecta, the domain trifecta is then going to take that and operationalize it with each of their project teams. And then each of the project teams is going to take that and actually build it, test it, prototype it, and so on. Oops. So um, I kind of uh, touched on this a little bit before, but the trifecta can really be leveraged as an organizational structure as well, right? So in the, oops. Originally, I put this up as how you might structure your project teams. Um, let me just flip over here. But it might also be a reporting structure. So for example, all the UX designers within a given project may report up to a senior lead or a lead who's sitting at the domain trifecta level who may roll up and report to a director or the senior leadership team for each of those crafts or each of those disciplines. The nice thing about doing it this way means that your lead so for example, your domain, the domain lead, has intimate knowledge of what those individuals, what those team members are working on week over, uh, over week, as opposed to having their reports living over in another domain altogether. And so when you have them nice and close together, you ha there is a nice, rich interaction and a relationship that's built there that's multifaceted. It's not just about being a people lead, but it's also about being a project lead as well. Finally, trifectas can also help get, gain some insight into the, organizational, into the organization's health. Um, I was just having a conversation earlier and talking about how people can be hard. <laughs> Leading people can be really tough and be a challenging uh, role. And having a healthy organization is something that we're always striving for, but that can be really tough culture, work-life balance, there are a number of things go into it. And so how you can leverage the trifecta to sniff out where some of the bad smells are within the organization is always going to be a good move. Trying to get to a healthy organization structure and culture is ideal. So in these cases, the um, trifectas can help identify where you're missing uh, resources. So when it lays out in this way and you plot out actually on a map, hmm, I didn't realize that. Working on this problem set, we actually don't have any designers at all. They're all just engineers and maybe a PM. Um, as opposed to talking about Mark and Chris and Kathy and Sue and so on. Um, when you actually map it out from a skills perspective, then you can have a better sense of what the makeup of that organization is. And here, then, you end up with teams or people being hired into project teams as opposed to being hired into the overall organization or the overall engineering department. Now you're a part of an actual team that's centered around and aligned around a critical problem. Uh, and also, the trifectas really help with the efficiency of communication because now not everybody has to share information with everybody. You can have context shared where it actually matters. Uh, I think nine times out of ten, if you ask someone how they're doing today, they will probably give you the same answer, which is busy. How are things going? Oh, really busy, super busy. Time is such a precious commodity these days. So wherever we can make things more efficient, um, uh, the better. And the trifectas can be, can we can leverage them and their um, regular meetings to help cut down on wasting time. So asking efficient questions. What are some of the questions that trifecta should be asking their project teams and the product tri trifecta should be asking their domain trifectas to make sure that things are moving forward and that things are being uh, thought of? So the first thing is about team. Do we think we've assembled the right team? Do we have the right set of skills and resources? Do we have each of PM, engineering, and UX on the team? Second is alignment. Do we agree on the, on the goals and the vision for this project? 
Are we aligned on the same thing? Are, is this train all heading in the same direction? Or are actually, actually week over week, we seem to be coming up with new ideas and kind of veering off course? Scrappiness. Scrappiness is uh, one of Shopify's favorite words. Uh, I think resourcefulness has become scrappiness 2.0, but whatever. It's the same idea. It is, are we cutting corners in the right places, and are we making the right set of trade-offs? Right? Any decision is going to have negative consequences. There's always going to be good things and bad things about decisions. But are we always creating a better environment for the organization, for the product to be thriving and moving forward? Next is quality. Are we solving the customer's problems in the right way? How do we know that? Have we tested it? Do we have proof? Have we validated that indeed our customers are going to want um, want this. And finally, keeping score. Do we know that week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter, we are improving? Are we doing better against our goals? Are we getting better at measuring how long it takes us to do something? If we're doing this on a regular basis, um, measuring is a really important part of product development and being accountable to ourselves within the project team, within the domain area, and as a product organization overall will only contribute to its health. Um, there are many ways in which uh, I've been asked before, you know, how does this actually work day in and day out at in the office? What does it actually look like to, ha to have trifectas working? Um, I can tell you they do not wear black trench coaches, trench coats. They do not walk around with fancy earpieces. It is not anything like that. They look like everybody else. And that's, you know, I, I kind of say that in jest, but they're very much a part of that product organization. There are uh, weekly meetings that are held with that product trifecta, with the domain trifecta teams to just basically go around and do a team of teams stand up. What are you working on? What milestone are you on? Asking some of those questions that I just posed a, a minute ago with each of those trifectas. We also have a stand-up of stand-ups for each of the, um, uh, a member of each of the project teams within the, a particular domain. So that within a particular domain, projects can be sharing with each other and understanding challenges that each other are facing and maybe helping to solve some of those for them. Uh, I finished this slide with an ellipsis because there are a number of ways in which you can be working together or meeting with each other, engaging at each of those levels. It really just depends on what works best for your organization depending on how big you are. Okay, I um, have a couple of lessons learned that I just want to share with you around um, what what my team has learned over the past year or so. So as I said, Shopify Plus has been growing for about two years now in terms of it being a product organization. Over that time, it's gone from about four individuals to now we're at about 78 individuals. And so you can imagine the amount of change and churn and number of org models and structures that we've gone over in the last two years. And so I just wanted to share some of the insights that, we, that we've garnered. So the first one is that change can be hard. That's not the insight, because I know that's nothing new. We all know that change can be hard. But how can we leverage the trifecta model to minimize that thrash, right? As soon as you establish some kind of overall model, like I said before, when you spin up a new team or you need folks to move over onto a different problem set, you need to pivot the business a little bit, if folks already understand what that model is and already have a good sense of identity and alignment around a particular problem space, spinning up a new one really minimizes the thrash because now you're talking about, okay, I'm gonna take a, a new set of individuals. I'm not crisscrossing people across the organization constantly because we're just working as a giant team of folks. Um, someone within my organization likes to joke, uh, 
to it as a uh, bag of humans. We're not just working with a single bag of humans where we're just yoinking people all across. There is some structure and stability in place that allows change to happen in a really natural way. Individuals feel comfortable in the environment and they kind of understand what's happening. They end up with a sense of identity and camaraderie with the folks that they're working with as opposed to operating in this kind of sense of fear like, geez, any day now I could get moved away and I'm not gonna be working beside you anymore. There is a real sense of clarity and focus there. Working closely with colleagues on whom you may be challenging perspectives can be really hard. But what removes the difficulty is building strong relationships based on trust. If, if there is trust between, within that trifecta, you're better able to challenge and critique other folks' idea because people remove themselves from it. They appreciate that we're talking about the thing in the middle. I'm not actually attacking you. I'm not attacking whether or not I think you know your code or whether you're actually coming up with the best technical solution. You appreciate that I, just like you, have the interests of our product at heart, and we're talking about the thing in the middle. We're trying to find out the best solution, and that really only comes over time. Geez, I've been working with my engineering and PM counterpart for the better of 18 months now, and every day I'm now I'm learning a little bit more about them and realizing that I kind of need to change my approach sometimes. It takes a long time to build those relationships and really feel comfortable in them. So don't, under, don't underestimate it. Um, I say that to say, you know, don't start this model or think that working in a trifecta, geez, it's not working after a week. What's going on? This thing must not be working for us. Give it some time. Invest in those relationships, and you will get that back. Um, as the organization grows, identify the magnitude of the change and then act accordingly. So by this I mean it might not always mean that you need to spin up an entirely new domain area. Maybe to start with, if, you've got, if there's a new product idea that's coming up or a new feature set or an area to explore, maybe it's okay having it as a side project within a given domain, even if it doesn't totally make sense yet. But don't go ahead and spin up a new one until you're pretty sure that it's gonna be stable, that you know that that project area or that problem space is gonna be around for a while, because then you end up in this thrashy kind of model. So it's okay to experiment and grow within a given domain before flushing it out into a, a, its full-blown domain, for example. And you might even find that within a given project team, you can just experiment within there. It doesn't mean that you need to build a, an entirely new team. So think about what it is that the organization is trying to do. Leverage your domain and your product trifectas to help figure out what the right level of response is, and then go ahead and do that. Just because I'm telling you about project teams, domain trifectas, and product trifectas, does not mean that every change in the market or every new idea that's gonna come up is gonna need fit into that kind of model or means that you have to make such drastic change. All right, I've talked a lot about this and as I said, uh, Shopify is a very successful company who's been uh, working with R&D organizations for a while we're still all trying to figure it out. Every time you add a new person to the organization, the complexion changes a little bit, and now you have to go back and kind of question, how are we doing things? Are things still working for us? Do we need to change direction a little bit? So this is hard, it gets difficult, and add the technology scene onto that, and now we're working with technology that's changing on a, at a fast pace too. However, if you really hunker down and make sure that you have a strong set of perspectives that are aligned and gathered around that product table, if you make sure that both product management, user experience, and engineering are gathered and working in harmony, well, then maybe you'll have a party too. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me without the mic? Okay, good.
Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, does anybody have any questions for Davis? We have a mic here. If you can try asking if we can hear you very well, there's a mic. Come on down! <laughs> Tell him what is one. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, so I have, a, I have a two part question. Um, I was wondering when you're creating a new team and you're spinning up a new domain or uh, product team, do you prioritize? Uh, promoting people internally, or is it mostly like external hiring? And um, would you uh, consider like the ratio of like leadership skill in working with teams compared to like the technical skill of their own uh, respective field? Great questions, Steve, right? Yes, great questions. So the first one was about how do you pri prioritize internal hiring versus external hiring? So I'd first take a look at, well, there are a number of things that um, to ask yourself. One is, if I take resources off project A and move them to project B, do we, do we end up in a risky situation on project A? Is project A fat enough in terms of its resources where we can afford to pull a couple people off and it won't put that project in risk? If that's the case, then by all means, that might be a, a great a great uh, way to go. The other thing you might want to look at is how easy is it for us to hire? Do we need to hire like yesterday? Or do, do, you know, do we have a little bit of buffer time? Will it be in three months, six months, or so on? And depending on what the answer of, of that is, me, may afford you the time to actually recruit and hire from outside. So I think there are a couple of things to look at. Generally, there's no I wouldn't say there's any harm from taking an individual from a given project if you have the availability. One of the nice things about the trifecta model is that you can be building expert, domain expertise across projects, right? So that's one of the benefits. So for example, uh, if you have a shipping domain where you're talking about logistics of shipping and maybe packaging and maybe insurance are all different project teams, they're all rallied around the same uh, customer facing problem. So taking one individual and moving them to a new project within that domain means that they can take all that they know about your user and what your user's contacts and problems are and apply them to that new project. When you bring outside folks in, they're gonna have to rebuild that context. So depending on where that new project spins up, it might help to build it with some new folks as well as some existing folks for that context. And your second question was around leadership uh, of what's the balance of technical skill and leadership skill. So this is a great question. I think that to be an effective leader, you have to have empathy for your team members. You have to understand generally the kinds of problems that they're going through, what it means to have quality at, in your particular craft, what it does it mean to have high, uh, you know, high quality designs. What does great code look like? You don't necessarily have to be the world's best coder to lead in that. You know, I'd say that Usain Bolt's uh, coach, pretty sure was not the fastest person in the world, but he got him to that place. So you don't have to be the best at that thing, but you do have to have some understanding of the mechanics and what got that person there. The other thing on leadership, though, is that uh, being a people lead is hard. It is a lot harder to lead people than it is to focus on the, you know, like, um, I shouldn't say that. I, I don't want to undermine the value or the complexity of being a technical lead, but being a people lead is a very different set of skills than being a technical lead. And so I think there's a little bit of balance there. I think you'll probably find it in the teams as you, as, as you see them execute, you'll see people just generally take on different roles. And some people are just kind of naturally attuned to that. Some people are more people person and have that, have that in them. Whether or not you have to wait until they're 100% perfect for a people lead role, I'd say no. At least our philosophy is that people will grow into that as well. Um, so I think there's a balance between those two. Um, I guess the question is, why is that domain dissolving? Is it because we're really doubling down on this part of the product, in which case maybe taking those people and consuming them within another domain is the way to go? Because you're actually going to start up three more projects within this, within this space that the product trifecta has said, you know what, we need to double down and 
in you know this particular area. Those people might get assumed there. This is also where, unfortunately, layoffs happen sometimes when you deinvest in a certain area. If you're not reinvesting in somewhere else, sometimes those people can go there. Maybe they could be repurposed to other areas. Um, it really depends on, I think, why you're deinvesting or why you're dissolving that domain area. You might scatter those folks across as opposed to just starting up brand new projects with that team intact. Um, the only thing that's constant is change. That is a motto that we are really adopting where I work. Um, and it's about getting folks used to that, getting folks used to not being used to anything, except that you know that there's going to be some safety in, in place. And generally, there's going to be some heuristics, and you can understand why we're making these changes. But it, that is not uncommon where projects spin up, and then, oh, we got to pivot or we got to move. So the better equipped you can make your team for being able to deal with that change, open lines of communication, effective lines of communication, those are the kinds of things that are really going to help you so that that team can operate um, well in the face of change. Yes? Uh, so you showed a graphic of uh, the different levels of credit methods. Yes. Um, so what would you say to, let's just say, a UX designer working with a product credit method mm -hmm. um, to, like, if they didn't have, uh, if they were missing the role of UX, they would be right. uh, not just missing, but they never existed. Yes. 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 So. This is this totally. Um, I should not have painted the, well, I painted the perfect model. I did not paint the realistic model. What you are describing is the realistic model. So we have that right now. So in some cases, we actually hold it blank. There is a placeholder. It is a hiring rec. It is a TBD. And by calling that out every time, the intent is to make folks aware of our own biases, realizing that it's a risk scaling that up to the product level so they can be aware that, hey, we're missing this role. Um, that product trifecta has the responsibility to say, I think it's OK. I think this project is still on track. Maybe it is a very engineering heavy project and really doesn't need UX direction. Or maybe the product team can come in and, and steer it. And that's OK. Or maybe it's a big risk. Um, so sometimes we have paused or halted projects when those when those um, roles aren't filled. Um, the other thing is sometimes we have people filling both roles. So you'll be the UX designer on a given project and kind of standing in or and wholly owning the role as the trifecta owner as well across projects. So it really depends on what your organization needs. I'd say uh, design for the, the most risk to mitigate the, the most amount of risk and try to fill that in as best as you can. Good question. Yes. I'm curious where, uh, where you slot technical writers in between engineering and UX. So the technical writing is, is interesting. Um, at Shopify, UX, you, the user experience team is actually broken down into four different disciplines. So we have front end development, design, content strategy, and um, research. Thank you. Um, as the floor. So we have content strategists who are embedded within project teams to set the strategy for that given area. Right now, we have uh, writers, documentation help folks, who operate as a service layer to those project teams. But we encourage, uh, as much as possible, the content roles, like even in product content marketing, and the content strategies embedded in that team and the writer to be working in kind of as much as they can in an aligned way within that project team. And sometimes, um, actually, that content strategist is, is operating within that domain level, so working across projects. Because often, depending on how they related they are, the content strategy might actually apply to a couple of those projects and not just the one. So right now, the writing role is actually in a service layer, but we try to group content in terms of at least encouraging those folks, folks to work together as much as they can. We have time for one more question if anyone has one. So you mentioned when Shopify Plus first started, you were over four people. Yes. Um, a lot of our 
probably we will in this room are, are small organizations. Um, so when you were only four people, did you did some people have to act as PM and UX? And how did how did if you did that, how did you balance those two things? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, I would say that in the early days, we didn't do a great job of that because you saw how our early product offerings went. Um, it's it's. It's, it's definitely can be done and can be done successfully. I think it's about really being aware about what those perspectives means. It's not just about paying lip service to asking a couple questions and kind of brushing them off, but really calling those out as, geez, do we know our product market fit? Do we know the direction that we're heading? Do we even know that this is the right way to do this? Have we got the right user research to be able to answer this? And you have to kind of have the confidence to say no and figure out what to do because of that. I don't think you can just say, well, we don't have that, so let's just continue on. You know, we, we asked the PM questions. Some of them we could answer, some of them we couldn't. I think as soon as you start to pull yourself in that way, then, you're, then we're kind of missing the point. Um, and, and I would say it's not easy, right? When you are in that situation, which is definitely not uncommon, um, you have to find a way to balance each of those three priorities to making sure. So whether that means that someone is pulling double duty and doing the coding and doing some design work or doing the coding and doing the research, um, that's why pair programming, pairing on a lot of stuff, not just pair programming, but pair design, pair research, that's so powerful because you're gaining empathy for the other roles and the other disciplines within your team. You don't just get so heads down so that when you all of a sudden lose your PM, for example, you're not like, well, it wasn't my job. No idea what that was involved. You actually understand what that person did and have some empathy for it and maybe can even pitch in and help where the whole team feels the burden of missing out on that role or that set of perspectives. Great, okay, we have some stuff to give away. Um, <laughs> And thank you very, very much, Davis. Thank you.